Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's Ag Dialogue session. Um, I'm Heather Gessner. I'm going to serve as your host for today's meeting. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about cons cattle considerations given the financial situation that is going on across the state and nation. Um, just some quick housekeeping things uh, as we go forward here. You're currently muted, I believe. Um, if you'd like to turn on your video, that'd be great. If you wanted to share us your lovely picture um, today. Uh, if not, that's okay too. We highly understand. If you would like to ask questions, you can do that one of two ways. We either have a chat feature down in the bottom of the directions and some of the tools there, and you saw that information uh, scrolling through the slides um, as you signed in. There is also the option to unmute your microphone and ask questions um, verbally if you would like to do that as well. So if you have questions as we go through today, feel free to do that. Um, one cleaning um, housekeeping feature I guess we need to do is let you know that due to some holiday plans and schedules we had to move our agenda around a little bit so today um, I'm going to kick off the presentations then we'll move to Dr. Daly's uh, and then Olivia will give her presentation and Laura Edwards will wrap up the meeting instead of lead off. So um, we did a little switching there and hope that doesn't cause problems for anybody as we go forward. Um, like I said, please ask your questions as we go forward. If you um, have some conversation about some of the topics, that would be great. We are going to try to get through four topics within the hour today. So not uh, very deep and maybe a little faster than what uh, you're really ready for, but we also hope to have this um, recorded and have the recording sent out to you so you can watch it later and uh, pause and go at your own speed as we go through the presentations. Um, again, I'm Heather. I'm based out of the Sioux Falls Regional uh, Extension Center, and uh, my official title is Livestock Business Management Field Specialist. So um, I think with that, we're going to kick off the presentations today so that we can kind of stay in our scheduled time slots and not get very far behind uh, with the first presentations. Okay, so I hope you can see the slideshow um, and have that come up for you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit here about backgrounding calves for 2019 and 2020. Um, what are we doing with those calves that were um, on the ground all summer and we've watched them grow and had great expectations for and uh, see what we can do to maybe uh, look at some income and potential returns for, for them this fall. So a lot of decisions in 2019 had to be made um, very differently than maybe what we've done them in the past. Uh, 2019, I think, is one of those years that everyone is ready to uh, just be done with and put away, but we still need to make sure that we're marketing and looking at this year's current craft crop. Um, you know, there's been a lot of guys that traditionally sell at, uh, at after backgrounding a little while that are selling directly to the sale barns due to the condition of their lots and those types of things. You know, they didn't, weren't able to get in and clean them out. Manure has built up. Um, so we're a little worried about pen condition. So calves have gone to the sale barn a little quicker than what some people traditionally do. Um, the other consideration is that some individuals didn't have the quantity or quality of the feed that they normally have available and so those calves went to the sale barn so that the harvested forages that we did get put up go to the cattle operation or the cow operation and not into the calves so um, some other considerations and reasons that we've heard calves go into sale barns sooner than normal is some immediate cash flow needs. Maybe we didn't have that income from corn or soybeans sales that we normally have and that we utilize for either some of our rental um, payments, if we had to pay off some of our operating notes or long-term notes, uh, some of those cash flow needs required that uh, operators sold calves early. And that might be some considerations that, that you're actually looking at right now and what do we do to maximize income as, as much as we can. So the last two bullets that we have up there, the, the expected returns, whoops, excuse me, 
The expected uh, costs and the potential returns are what the main goal of today's conversation is going to cover. I'm going to look at some um, things that you have, um, some tools and budgets maybe that we have available to you um, so that you can look at any potential returns for your operation as you go forward. Um, with this budget calculator, hopefully you'll be able to analyze those input costs, maybe make some changes uh, if at all possible um, so that we can increase revenue. And then, you know, kind of one of those caveat or those extra bonus features is that when you have your information into this budget calculator and this uh, program, you've got that information so you can take it to the banker and, uh, show him what your projected uh, income is, what your operations costs look like, and also what your marketing plan looks like. And uh, when I talk to lenders, all of those are things that they like to hear from you um, about your plans and what your projections are for the year. So if we talk about the budget calculator that I'm going to show you today, uh, this is an Excel file and it's downloadable from the SDSU Extension website. That website is um, listed on your screen. If down there at the bottom in that blue area, um, it's kind of small and uh, we'll show that to you a little bit bigger at the end of the presentation if you would like that, um, if you'd like to put some numbers into this. so. Uh, what I'm going to do today is try to walk you through the different components of the calculator. And uh, just for clarification, I might say the word calculator as the file does all the calculating for you. I might also call it as a tool because I also feel, feel that this is an important tool um, in your operation, maybe just as important as a cordless drill or a hammer might be for doing different operations on your op um, for your for your farmer ranch. So. To kind of get us started here, the one thing I want you to start looking at is um, anything in those yellow boxes, that's where um, you have the ability to personalize your information. So if it's got one of those yellow cells in it, uh, like this one here is yellow, um, you know, that's where you're able to put your numbers for your operation, which is uh, very important because this example um, is here for you to look at and to utilize. However, I really want to emphasize that it is just an example and until you personalize the information, it really means nothing for, the, for your individual operation. So to start off, if we just kind of walk through what the what the th is available here. Um, it starts with livestock income. So we're looking out and saying, at what weights are we planning on selling these calves and at what price do we anticipate receiving for them? Additionally, there is the death loss um, component that you can put into this, um, this cell because unfortunately that is part of the situation. Usually um, there is some death loss there. Additionally, as you go through um, the calculator, the other big thing that we need to look at is those livestock costs. What does it cost you to put that five weight or whatever weight calf that you are putting into your lot and uh, planning on putting some pounds on? For this example, I included the, the cost as an opportunity cost. What price would I get if I sold those five weight calves today? Um, so I put the $168 in there for five weights. Um, we need to be purchasing them as an enterprise. So whether you have the actual cost of production for raising your own calves, that would be a great number to put in there so that one enterprise is purchasing the calves from the other enterprise per se. Um, otherwise, what, what could you get if you take them to the sale barn? So we really need to know those numbers. Then the rest of the information there, as you go through the list, it has veterinarian and drug expenses. Work with your veterinarian to create the proper health management protocols for your animals. Um, it might not be the same as it is for everybody else's. If you're um, vaccination protocols are different based on your individual situation. If you run a natural program versus an implant program, you know, make sure that you're including all those costs there. Different supplies that you might need to purchase on a per animal basis. 
Uh, marketing costs are also part of this component. You know, when you take an animal to the sale barn, what are the different percentages that go to the sale barn? Um, include the feed that they're charging you for and those types of things. So we really want to make sure that all those uh, marketing costs are included there. There's also uh, spots where if you have hired labor and you're allocating different labor percentages to the uh, to this backgrounding operation, they can go in here. Um, on the other cost side of things, interest rate needs to be included. If you have an operating note, please include that rate. Um, if you want to allocate power and utility costs, especially for the winter time when you do have utilities going out to keep waters open and those types of things, building in equipment investments. Um, one of the big important things to include to make sure that you have the number of months that you're going to be feeding these animals. Um, so in this example, in 3.3 months, we're looking at increasing the five weight to an 800 or an eight weight um, for the example. And we're going to do that all on a grain ration with no pasture involved. Uh, shipping is also included here. Make sure that you're including um, either commercial trucking to the sale barn or what it costs for you as a miles per gallon type of situation um, if you're hauling your own calves to the sale barn. So shipping is also one of those important components. Um, shipping home from pasture and home and then also back to the to the sale barn as you go there. So the next section that we're going to talk about here is the feed cost section. This area actually requires um, a couple different things. One, that you include a balanced ration for your operation. Um, this one was created with the help of Warren Rushi, the SDSU Extension Feedlot Specialist. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that I gave you a ration and, a, and an example that would get to that 2.5 to three pounds again, I need to turn my five weights into eight weights um, in the three months that I have allocated. So you need to go in, develop your ration, figure out what the pounds per day um, is going to be fed. And then at the very beginning of the spreadsheet, you'll notice that um, these feed stuffs over in the, under the type category are um, over here. Uh, that they're not in yellow. There's one input section where you input all of your feed costs and what their price per unit cost is so that you can, wow, those lines got kind of crazy there. I apologize for that. Um, but when you start putting those prices in, they carry to all of the different um, spreadsheets that are available in this um, document so that you're very consistent with your prices so that when if you're making different marketing decisions and different feeding timeline decisions you're using the same prices for feed and inputs all the way through so um, you have your feed costs we know what we're going to feed per day and what that price per unit is so that the, the calculator does the rest of the calculation for the total amount of feed that's fed and then it does the full math for us at the end if you know um, what your cost of production for producing a bushel of dry corn is, you can include that as your price of, of feed. Um, right now, I just have a price, an elevator price um, for producing or for purchasing a bushel of feed or what I could potentially sell it for as another opportunity cost. So we get into the favorite section, um, at least most people's favorite section. They want to see where the money is and how much that is. Based on this example um, of gaining 300 pounds in 3.3 months at 3.3 pounds per day, uh, we're looking at $1,156 worth of income, less the death loss rate that we put in here. So it's very important that if you have a historical death loss of, of your operation that is greater than the 1% that I have as this example, make sure you're including that. Uh, it's very critical um, when it comes to marketing and looking at total returns that we account for those calves that we had to buy um, that are now not available for sale. So make sure that you're including that component as we go through. The next slide covers um, and kind of 
brings all of the um, numbers together into one spot so that we can see what our total purchase price is, our total feed costs, and then all the other expenses are brought together on one page and gives us our total operating costs at the bottom there. Next thing we need to look at um, is the returns, and this is where we're looking at if we make any um, income for this operation and given the example that I have put together our return for labor and facilities for this example is about a hundred dollars. A couple things I really want you to remember here is that this is my example only. You need to include your own numbers. Um, a lot of those line items if we're off by five to ten dollars uh, and we're off five to ten dollars on two or three line items that really takes away that profit potential that we have. So make sure that you're using your own numbers working with your veterinarian to have the proper veterinary expenses um, go through and figure out what marketing expenses are and those types of things. Another thing I would like you to look at is to compare that total income opportunity um, of selling calves and selling feed. Maybe that is a better operation, a better option for your operation this year. Just because we always feed calves doesn't mean that 2019 that's the best decision for our operation. We need to run them on numbers. And then we also need to look at our market and make sure that our local sale barn can uh, accommodate the types of calves that we have. If you traditionally don't have buyers that are looking for red, white, or mixed color lots, um, maybe an increase in mileage and moving to a different sale barn might be something of benefit for you. Um, so go give your barn a call, um, talk to them about what the bidders that they have in the seats are, um, and make the best decisions for your operation, not just what we've always done. As I try to wrap up uh, kind of quick here and behind schedule already, um, one of the beauties of this uh, calculator, or at least I think it's a beautiful component of it, is its ability to evaluate different buying and selling prices without having to re-enter the data all into the same a new spreadsheet. So if you look at this one, just kind of quick, um, you can go down the selling price column of 146 that we used in our example. And if you come down that line item and we use 168 as our um, cost of animal, there's the $113 worth of income that we had potential for. So this gives you the ability to look at, okay, if I can still purchase that calf at 168, but my selling price drops to 138, what does that do to my uh, returns and uh, you can kind of make marketing decisions as you move that way forward. It also allows you if you're sitting in the stands trying to bid on calves look at maybe the profit potential if you increase your bid to 173 with the same selling price or even a lower selling price um, we can make some of those decisions as we move forward that way. So it kind of gives you some of those that really quick view of what the changes are if prices are higher or lower at selling or purchase time. There's two more charts that are part of the calculator. As we know, a lot of times feed is um, our cost of gain is what changes on us, um, especially if we're buying feed incrementally instead of at one time at the beginning of the feeding period. So this one gives us the same ability to look at that $168 purchase price for our animal compare it with what it would cost to or our prices at sales time and then look at changes in gain um, of cost of gain and as you go obviously you know sell it for more and feed it for less the profit potential increases but this gives us an idea of what that profit change would be if expenses get higher or the calf market would uh, decrease instead of going up which we all hope it does. The last chart on the spreadsheet that looks very similar, except it increases our purchase price to 178 so we had a $10 higher purchase price, um, and evaluating what that does to our um, profit potential based on cost of gain. So if we stayed with the $0.68 cents where our cost of gain per day was um, in our example, increase the purchase price by um, $10, we drop our potential income to $63. So that's just one tool that you can use to look at maybe some profit potential or maybe some marketing changes that we want to look at to uh, 
reduce or re some of our risk that we have with the CAV. Um, so as we look at the market situation, um, this was the March 2020 chart as of Tuesday morning. Obviously, there's a couple more days of um, to add to the top of that chart. But the big thing to notice is that increase in prices since October and November, which is, uh, is good for the bottom line there. Um, one thing I would like you to really consider is what's a good price for you and what kind of price target are you looking to make sales at? And if you're willing to sell calves, if prices go up $20 a head or $30 a head, what kind of move does the market have to make um, for that type of income potential as you go forward? So um, as you see those prices go up, when are you calling the trucks? If it hits a magic number that creates the income that you need uh, before markets would start to take a downswing um, if that should happen. Uh, many, many price or different pieces to consider as we look at marketing this year's calves. Volatility hasn't been too crazy in the last couple of months, so we really haven't had that type of situation to deal with this year. Um, but we want it something that we need to really keep in mind, especially if you're looking at purchasing LRP, the Livestock Risk Protection Insurance, or using options to put some risk protection on that that way. Um, other things you need to think about, you know, is given this example, we looked at a three month time frame. Given your situation um, and your you know, maybe you have different labor requirements, uh, your lots are in different shape than normal. Um, maybe you can get them through February when the ground is frozen, but come March and April, you're not looking at having calves on feed during the mud. So what does that do to your marketing plan and your changes? Um, and that's where the budget can hopefully come in and help you make some of those decisions um, from a financial situation and a marketing situation as well. So if we kind of wrap up a little bit, um, the big thing, you know, you need to know what your numbers are. Don't just use the numbers that I put in this example farm because that's strictly all they are as an example. Uh, make sure you look at the amount of risk you can manage and that you're trying to market as we go forward um, to cover that risk and the income that you need available to cover cash flow needs for, you know, not just feed for these calves, but also look at the amount that you need to cover any long-term loans that you may have, any operating loan, loan payments that need to be made, and those types of things. Consider your marketing timelines. When is marketing best for you? When can trucks get into your, op into your um, facilities? Uh, how long can you plan on feeding them? Um, is there something that we can do different or increase to watch our risk prote protection and those types of things? Uh, evaluating feed feed timelines and market changes. If there's a, a news information break that comes out, you know, it's things that we need to look at that way. Um, make sure that you're flexible enough with your marketing plan that we don't just keep feeding because we have feed or for the sake of feeding. But if there's a change in the markets that would be beneficial to your operation that we take that. And then know your limits. What do you physically have available um, in the form of your lots, in the form of labor? Uh, look at the whole the whole operation and see what you can reasonably handle for 2020. Uh, here's my contact information. Uh, the new, whoop, oops, excuse me. Here's the, actually the, the web page where that decision aid tool is at. If you click on there um, or go to that link, you'll be able to download it to your, to your uh, computer and input your own numbers there. Uh, since I'm way over time, here is my contact information. If you would like to um, follow me on Facebook at this uh, at this page, a lot of the information that I try to put out and keep updated is is hosted there. Otherwise, feel free to give me a call. Um, we're at this phone number. Send me an email here. Uh, we have recently moved, and I forgot to update this. Uh, we are no longer on 8th Street. We're down on 38th Street, uh, actually down by the, the Empire Mall. So we've, we've changed parts of town. So uh, with that, I will stop sharing and uh, check the chat box quick. Um, 
I don't see any questions there. And since I've already taken most of Russ's time, I'm going to uh, move on and let him go on with his presentation. If you have questions for me, please uh, feel free to get a hold of me um, at a different time. Sorry, Russ. Take oh, as wow. much time as you need. Well, okay. We'll uh, we'll try to get uh, caught up here. Now I got to see if I can do this. All right. Are you seeing what uh, you should be seeing there? Yes. We are. Okay. Good. So uh, Heather asked me. So I'm uh, Dr. Daly, Russ Daly, uh, who uh, I serve as the Extension Veterinarian here at SDSU. And one of the questions that uh, Heather posed to me for this. Um, dialogue here was, uh, you know, what would be one or two um, expenses, health expenses to definitely not uh, short yourself on this winter? Um, you know, there's, you know, Heather mentioned the uh, veterinary expenses and, and certainly we can rack up quite a bill with all the different things we do to those animals and all the different medications that we can provide to those animals, but which one, which ones would really be the ones to uh, make sure of uh, this winter, considering all the stuff we went through last uh, um, you know, winter and spring and uh, uh, has, and, and what, um, you know, what, what can we, uh, what can we really expect uh, for for a, the best bang for the buck? So, you know, veterinarian. So, some of the things you probably think about that I would think about, and, and these are all important, very, very important things, would be um, on the cow calf uh, side of things. Definitely uh, reproduction and preg checking. Make sure that uh, we have uh, uh, we're not feeding cows that aren't producing for us over the winter. And definitely a big thing. Um, you know, there's all sorts of vaccine programs that we could talk about as well. And these are very important uh, on the calf side of things as well as the cows this winter. Uh, when we think about trying to prevent diseases such as calf scours uh, coming uh, coming up uh, uh, next calving season, uh, very definitely not things to skimp on. Um, uh, de-lousing and external parasite issues. Um, you know, those are things we deal with every year and can directly affect the uh, productivity of those cows and indirectly affect the productivity of the calves uh, in the uh, in their their initial growing phase. And as well as deworming, you know, deworming cows, deworming um, th those animals so they're um, they're not influenced by parasite problems uh, going into the nursing season. Um, so there's all sorts of different things that we can uh, uh, look at uh, for uh, health care expenditures. Um, but if we really want to look at the, this is the ultimate goal for the calving season coming up, uh, a, a nice healthy uh, calf that's vigorous and we don't really have to spend a lot of time with, we don't have to treat for pneumonia, we don't have to treat for scours, who's going to get up and nurse that cow and, and start start growing you know if, if this is the ultimate goal i i i kind of went a different little direction here with um with my intervention and and it's more of a nutritional intervention and i hope i didn't step on not stepping on uh, olivia's toes here for the rest of the presentation here but uh one thing that's going to affect the vigor and the health of those uh calves uh, profoundly, and I think we really saw this last winter was uh, uh, vitamin A and vitamin E supplementation. This this is, is something that I feel can have benefits for the calves um, in very many different ways, and those different ways are not always obvious when it comes to the health of the calf. So, what do these what do these vitamins do um, for the these calves? So, um, focusing in on vitamin A, um, you know, if we see a, a low levels of vitamin A in calves, um, those, those first three main bullet points are what we really see. Now you'll go back to the books and you go back to your schooling and you'll, you'll see vitamin A deficiencies as having eye problems or white muscle disease. And, and certainly we can see that um, in, in calves. There, there's an example of white muscle disease in a heart and, and, and we can see that but really what we see more often are just these nondescript clinical signs of, you know, a calf's just slow to, slow to nurse, slow to get up. You know, maybe we've got some, um, you know, mild scours or respiratory disease that's kind of nondescript. Um, and, 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 and what, we, what we see is that the low levels of vitamin A in calves really have an effect on the immune system 
uh, the, the responsiveness of the immune cells when they are faced with a pathogen, as well as just maintaining protection at the mucous membranes of the respiratory tract and the digestive tract. So if we lose some of that protection because we're a little low on vitamin A, we can have pneumonia more, more commonly uh, hit these calves as well as, well as scours. When we talk about vitamin E, very much the same thing. You know, vitamin E deficiency in the books, uh, the dramatic deficiency is white muscle disease. Boy, if, if we have cases of, of this in calves, that, that really de demonstrates a severe, profound problem uh, in, in the nutrition of those calves. And, and that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. The white muscle disease is something that we'd actually see uh, calves die from. But again, what we really see with low vitamin E in calves is, is this reduced uh, vigor, reduced immune system function, and there's reduced protection at these very important parts of the body where we need it for these growing calves. So one of the troubles is when we're developing that fetus and the cow is developing that fetus in, in the uh, womb, there, there's, no, there's no crossing the placenta uh, of vitamin A and E. So even though we have, uh, we might be able to get the, um, the, the, the levels up in our cows, uh, that doesn't always translate to a calf that's going to be born hitting the ground with adequate levels of vitamin, uh, vitamins A and E. So the, the issue that we deal with then is how important is colostrum? So that calf, if it's not getting any uh, vitamin A and E through the placenta, it's totally dependent on that milk that they're uh, drinking from the mother and in, in specifically the colostrum, those first, uh, those first meals. So what we have to do is treat the cow, or the heifer, to make sure that uh, the colostrum that they produce has good high levels of vitamin A and vitamin E in it when that calf gets up to nurse. So um, colostrum is not just important for you know, the, the specific protection against specific uh, diseases, it's really important nutrition-wise too, and in, in, in very, um, in, in very uh, subtle, mild, but very important ways. So um, when we're when we're on green grass and we have good quality green forages, uh, those are the best natural sources of vitamins A and E. We don't have problems with deficiencies or low levels in animals that are grazing green grass. Um, during the during the spring and summer. So this is the time of year when we have have these issues and we have to think about supplementing those those animals. Um, so cows can store vitamin A in their liver for for up to four months, you know, so, um, you know, think about uh, the uh, uh, the, the cows uh, four months ago probably were, uh, you know, still had some access to some pretty green forage, but uh, that, that, time, that time frame is shifting. And this is a little controversial with, among the scientists, but uh, we don't really consider a whole lot of vitamin E storage in the cow's system um, uh, during, during gestation or during, during uh, their, their ingestion of vitamin E from these forage sources. So um, during the times of year when they're not grazing, this is the time we need to worry about vitamin A and E supplementation. And so there's the rates that we want to look at. Um, most of the supplements that we see um, marketed uh, for, uh, um, for cows during the winter are going to meet these kind of requirements uh, you know, on, a, on about a pound uh, per head per day kind of level. But this is what you want to look at the, uh, the feed tag and make sure that those, uh, uh, those, those levels are being provided uh, per head per day during, during the time of year when we don't have access to green grass, which is right now. So one of the questions I always get as a veterinarian, and certainly I, I use the, these products with, with clients, um, is that uh, can we just get these animals in and give them an injection? Well, I want to say that uh, you can. We can certainly do that. Um, but the feed supplementation is much better. Uh, it's more natural the way that the uh, vitamins are processed in the body. And uh, it's going to, uh, it's, it's that, that constant supplementation during the non-grazing season is going to really be the best option for maintaining these uh, levels of vitamin A and E in the cow to be passed on to the colostrum. However, in these, in, in certain instances, you might want to, uh, uh, do this you know, give give cows injections of these vitamins. Uh, this is something you want to talk with your veterinarian about for sure. 
But um, in order to maintain the storage of vitamin A, especially in the body, you'd have to be given monthly injections uh, to these cows. Um, some, one of the things that's been um, talked about is that uh, you know, if you're really in a pinch and you're not able to do this during the, um, the um, winter, which not many people would be getting those cows in every month to give a shot, uh, one injection before they calf to maintain the, the uh, liver stores. What happens around the time of calving is the, the, that, that um, liver uh, repository of, these vi of, of vitamin A will, will drop pretty um, profoundly around the time of calving. So if you're going to do this, give it pretty close to calving uh, to make sure that those levels are in the body at, at, at the time you need them. Not all products are the same. Um, and... Uh, um, I'll get to that here in the next slide, but I also want to say that um, you want to use these products with a little bit of caution. They've been associated when you use them in conjunction with other vaccines, say a pre-calving vaccine, um, especially when you're giving other uh, additional products at, at the same time. We have seen some abortions. We have seen some problems in cows. Uh, going down uh, again, having abortions when we when we use these kind of products in conjunction with others. So if you're going to use these, uh, get them in and, and use them by itself, so they're not combined and not giving at the same time uh, as the others. Now I say not all the products are the same. You'll see products like this, the old vitamin A, D, and E. Well, if you read the um, bottle, you see that the level of vitamin E in this in this injection is so low as to not really be very, very um, uh, significant at all. So you want to want to choose something that's got a good, good levels of vitamin E. You know, the, these products increasingly are, are starting out with their the title saying something about vitamin E, which is uh, 300 units per uh, um, per mil, and then the A and uh, the um, a, a is there also, and, and along with some vitamin D, although we really don't worry too much about vitamin D if the cows are outside. Uh, so now if you, so I'd stay away from just the regular low level um, vitamin E, uh, use something like this that's got the uh, 100,000 100, uh, units of vitamin A and the 300 units of vitamin E. Now, what about uh, giving, just not worrying about the cows at all and just giving these calves an injection at birth, well, in a pinch, when you notice that that uh, things are really going uh, south with reduced vigor in calves, and there's a high high level of suspicion that um, vitamin deficiencies are lower lower than le lower than normal vitamin levels might be an issue in these calves. Um, they can be given to calves at birth. And I've seen this um, in certain cases really do some good to calves and really turn them around. Um, but again, you know we're, we're they're, they're not the natural way that this calf should be getting uh, these vitamins, which, which is, is through good cow nutrition during the winter and good paying attention to, to um, uh, good uh, colostrum uh, transfer as well. So I caught us up maybe by a minute or so, Heather, but uh, if there's any questions, I could sure uh, uh, take time to uh, try to answer them. Uh. Any questions for Dr. Daly? I don't see any in the chat box. Um, so with that, I think we'll turn it over. Olivia, are you back in from the barn? Olivia's doing double duty today. She's also at the uh, AI school in Brookings today. So yes. she, she's one of our newest extension team members and we made her do two things on the same day. So I know, we appreciate really, her being here. You guys are really working me hard. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to extension. <laughs> thank you, thank you. No, I'm, I'm happy to be here and thanks for inviting me. Um, so like Heather said, I am the new cow-calf extension specialist. My name is Olivia and I'm in the Sioux Falls Regional Office along with Heather. Um, and she asked me to kind of do a little bit of a talk on consideration for cull cows and we'll kind of be mainly focusing on the feeding aspect of things. So um, ultimately, what are some reasons to cull? Why are we culling cows? Olivia, um, could you yeah. share your slides? Oh shoot, did I not? Uh, one second. Uh, 
Oh goodness. Okay. You there got you it, go. Heather? Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, here we go. Okay, so again, so what are some of those reasons to call or why are we calling these cows? Um, the biggest one is reproductive failure. Uh, a lot of times we see that um, due to pregnancy status, uh, that cow is going to be leaving the herd. Um, according to some data, it's they say about 33% uh, of cows are culled simply due to pregnancy status. Another one is our age of cows. Uh, those cows that are older are more likely to have calves that are uh, lighter than cows that are younger in the herd. Um, the Beef Improvement Federation actually shows that uh, cows that are 11 years or older are going to have calves that are 18 to 20 pounds lighter than younger cows that are in the peak of their production. Again, some of those older cows are actually going to require a higher plane of nutrition, so it's going to cost her a little more to feed her and, and maintain that cow in the herd as well. Looking at a cow's progeny, um, if she's producing a calf that's uh, lower weight than a lot of the, the calves that, a lot of the calves counterparts, um, she's really probably not covering her overall cost. So that's another reason to consider culling her. Um, however, this is going to require taking records um, to determine which cows are producing those underperforming calves. And then a big one uh, for a reason to cull is gonna be the structure, confirmation, and disposition of those cows. Um, really, if those cows are having feet and leg structure problems, it's going to affect their longevity, whether or not they're walking in a pasture or long distances to water, um, that it really adds no benefit to you by keeping that female. And then again, if you have like a flighty or a mean female that's dangerous to you, just doesn't need to be on the, on the um, place, that's another reason that we can get rid of females. So when we call cows, it's important to kind of consider when we're going to call cows. Um, this here is just a, a graph here showing the slaughter cow prices over the last five years. And you can see uh, that blue line there in 2018 um, was some of the lowest prices that we've had and they've continued to stay lower. Um, but we also see that, especially here in the summer, in South Dakota, we have higher prices compared to in the fall and winter, and really that's just that supply and demand. We've got more cows grazing pastures in the summer, um, less cows going to market at that time, so those prices are higher. And then vice versa is when we have cows um, that we're going to call at weaning, we just have a greater influx of cows going into market, thus causing that, that market price to, to be lower than in those summer months. So just understanding market prices and times when to cull cows becomes important in the overall um, profitability of marketing these cull cows. So then the question becomes, how can we benefit from retaining cull cows rather than just quickly selling them? So there's some things that we're gonna wanna consider prior to um, trying to add value to those cull cows. Um, one of those, again, we're going to want those thin to moderate condition females, but we're going to want them to be healthy and sound. Those females that are thin um, and in more moderate condition, they have more opportunity to add weight through that compensatory gain um, than those cows that are already in a higher condition. Um, those that are in a higher condition will most likely add more weight as fat and have a lower feed conversion. However, it is important to remember that even though those feed conversions may not be great on those heavier cows, you're still going to be adding value due to those seasonal prices and additional weight um, that you're putting on those, um, those fleshier cows. There was research done um, in Miles City, Montana with uh, Rick Funston in 2003, and that actually showed that cows that are in a body condition score of six still gained really well. So there is opportunity there for even some of your fleshier cows to add profit. 
Um, the buy sell margin, again, you're going to want that to be positive, knowing where your markets are. Um, if they're high and if feed prices are low, that's ultimately going to be what um, gets you uh, the best bang for your buck. Which then that kind of moves into the cost of gains need to be cheap. If we can feed that cow for a cheaper price, we're ultimately going to um, get more out of her. Sufficient feed supplies. Um, really, this is a big one. If you don't have enough feed inventory to maintain your core cow herd, then those cold cows just need to go as soon as possible. And then your financial solvency. If, if financial risk can be absorbed, then feeding cull cows um, would be more of a benefit or could potentially be done on your operation. So how can we minimize feed costs without sacrificing production? Um, can we add value to these cows through feeding and different management strategies? First, I think we need to consider the value of the cow. Again, um, we need to look to make sure she's sound, make sure she's healthy and in that thin to moderate condition so that we can add some more um, gain to her. Um, ultimately, if she does not meet this criteria, then she needs to be sold directly to a, pa a packer. Um, the next three bullets here are some of the ways that we can minimize feed costs without sacrificing that overall production. Um, one of those ways being a concentrate based feed diet, which will go through um, a winter grazing of crop residues and then the um, the addition of feed additives and growth promoting technology, which we'll talk a little bit more on the next few slides about each of those. So looking at that concentrated or concentrate based diet, um, when you're gonna start a cow on a high concentrate based diet, you wanna make sure you're starting slow, especially if those cows haven't currently been on a high concentrate diet so that that rumen can adapt. Um, so we would start these diets out at about 50 megacals per net energy gain. And then over the next two to three weeks, you'd work up to increase that diet to around 60 to 63 megacals um, per net energy and around 11.5% crude protein. And we can use a bunch of different alternative feed products to maintain or to make these diets. And that table there on the right kind of gives you an idea of some of those options. Ultimately, when we're eating cull cows, their requirements are low. They're not growing, they're not gestating or lactating. So those input costs are going to be lower because they just, they're requiring less. Some research that was actually done here at South Dakota State, um, looking at feeding some cull cows high concentrate diets for 50, 77, and 105 days, they did see um, increased gains, uh, gains of 2.81, 2.97, and 3.1 pounds per day. So there really is some benefit to feeding a concentrate-based diet, um, which could be um, considered for cull cows if you're, you're going to keep them and sell them in a, in a, at a higher market time. The next one is that winter grazing of crop residue. Again, this is another option and it's a reasonably cheap option. Um, they can, we can get a low, uh, low cost for rate of gain. That general rule to follow is one acre per cow per month. Um, Really, cull cows are probably going to need a few more acres to provide corn for a longer period of time. Um, but they do have the potential to gain about a pound and a half or more per day. Uh, so we, let's say we have a cow out on pasture for about two months. We could see a result of approximately 90 pounds or more of gain or an additional body score is what they say. So our table here to the right, um, we have three different options for feed, uh, feed cost options for cull cow rations. So our option A here, we're looking at a 1200 pound cow um, sold right after preg check. You know, we're not putting any cost of feed in her or anything like that. Selling her at that 1200 pounds, assuming market price is about $52 per hundred weight, our potential income there would be about $624. Now, if we 
look at option B, putting her out on corn sacks. We're gonna keep her for about 70 days and assume that she's gonna be putting on about two pounds per day. Um, that cost of gain, somewhere around a dollar per head per day, um, feed and labor. But at this time, we've added an additional 100 pounds to her. We're selling her at a different uh, market time, so our price has increased to about $63 per hundred weight. Now we're seeing a potential income of $749. And then finally, that option C, which is uh, the more intense feeding protocol, ration and yardage. We got our corn silage, distiller's grain, and corn stocks. But again, we're feeding her for that 70 days only. This time we're putting on an, ad an additional pound. Um, that feed cost is going to increase there. Um, but this time we can see that she's at, we've added 200 more pounds to this female. That market price goes up for us. So then our potential income becomes a little bit higher. However, this is a, a good um, example. And like Heather said, that's, it's really all it is. You need to remember that when you're plugging in your numbers, that they're your numbers, that you're putting in what you have in your resources um, in order to make something like this work for you. And then finally, another way that we can optimize profitability um, and help increase those gains is through utilizing feed additives and growth promoting technology. Uh, when we're feeding those high grain diets, the use of ionophores becomes really important because again, that feed efficiency in cold cows is relatively poor. Um, two examples here are the Momensin and Lassolicid or the Bovitec. Um, just important to note that Monensin can be fed to those bred cows that are going to remain in the herd, but the Bovitec is only approved for cows going to slaughter. Then some growth promoting technologies that we have. Um, we've got the steroidal implants. So we have our um, estrogenic and androgenic implants. And then we have our beta adrenergic agonists, those that are fed to our cows in feedlot. Um, research has shown that implants are actually the most effective in cull cows. Uh, that actually helps um, increase live weights, average daily gains, um, and then overall improved feed to gain ratios. And uh, some of those implants to be using uh, are implants with uh, 200 milligrams of Trenbolone or TBA. Uh, and some examples of those are Revolor 200, Cinevex Plus, or component TE200. Um, but ultimately those are gonna be what give you your greatest response. And then I guess an example of our beta adrenergic agonist would be the Optiflex, but um, we just don't see the same results with those as we do with implants. So to wrap up some things to consider, what can we do with cull cows to potentially add some um, profit to them um, really cow cows can offer that, that substan substantial source of income to an operation if you manage them correctly. And again, it's going to go back to what you have available. Um, but it is important to know that cow cows really generally account for 15 to 30% of income. And so there is, there is opportunity there to do something with those cow cows to make them work for your operation. I think a lot of us know that feed costs are the largest cost to consider uh, when we feed any animal, um, but also we need to remember those costs like yardage and transportation. And sometimes putting together, together an enterprise budget or a partial budget can help us calculate some of those break even selling prices um, to see if it would be something that we, you could consider on your operation. And then utilization of those growth promoting technologies can really be beneficial, can add that additional gain um, and that extra opportunity to um, make money on those cold cows. But I think the big picture is that every operation and situation is unique. One size is not going to fit all. And ultimately, a producer needs to look at the resources that they have available, calculate the benefits of retaining and feeding those cold cows and then see if it makes sense to sell them at a different time. Ultimately, when you have periods of high feed prices compared to the slaughter cow market, um, adding weight to cows may or may not be profitable. So just determine what works best on your operation and if this would be something that you could consider.
Otherwise, I don't have a picture yet, but this is my contact information and I have the correct Sioux Falls um, address on there in case you needed it. So, um, and that is all I have. Okay, thanks, Olivia. And yeah. way to show me up with having the right address <laughs> on there. I greatly appreciate that. <laughs> Any You're questions welcome. for Olivia before we move on? Okay, um, with that, uh, I think we'll turn it over to Laura Edwards and we'll get a climate update from her. Um, Laura, we did short you about 10 minutes so far, and mostly I'm still thinking it's my fault. So uh, we'll turn it over to you and uh, maybe next time I won't get ambitious with four presentations in a one hour presentation time slot. We'll just stick with two or three. So I will turn it over. Sounds good. Um, so I was asked to speak to the outlook um, for the winter and spring season. Uh, the most recent outlook for January and the months ahead uh, just came out yesterday. So I haven't even had time to do a news release or anything. I did a little Twitter thing, but that was about it. So um, before I get into that, though, just looking at our current situation, um, you know, we all know how wet it is out there and uh, it's been wet all year. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about records just yet, but this is this map just looks at soil moisture. Anything in the purple colors is above average uh, for this time of year, looking at the total amount of moisture in the column of soil. So, um, you know, a lot of us are seeing standing water out there. Um, and, and our soils are, are pretty full, and that's true all across the region. So we're not unique just here in South Dakota with that issue right now. You know, you see a similar in Montana, North Dakota, Minnesota, um, and some of our surrounding areas as well. So um, to kind of hone in on where we are here locally in South Dakota, uh, some of you may have seen this kind of map before. Uh, this is what we call the poker chip map. Uh, looking at our South Dakota Mesonet stations, um, each stack of chips, so to speak, uh, is one of our weather stations with the Mesonet, and we have soil sensors down through 40 inches in the profile. Um, this snapshot it is from early November. Um, the reason why I chose that is because that's before the soils froze, um, and essentially this is kind of where we're going to be starting off the next year, um, more or less, as the water really, that water movement really slows down in the winter. Um, and as the soils freeze, it kind of locks it in place. Um, so we kind of get stuck with what we have here in the fall season. Um, anything in the, the blue, darker blue is wetter. Green is towards the middle, you know, oranges are drier. You can kind of see that scale on the bottom as well. Um, and as you, as no big surprise to um, a lot of our eastern and northern areas are really very wet for this time of year. Um, I'll, I'll show you um, what 2018 looked like uh, on the next slide. But what's really unusual, especially the western areas, typically they dry out um, pretty strongly in the fall season, and that just didn't really happen this year. We were really wet all the way across the state. So honing in on your favorite location, any one of these stacks of chips, um, and I'll flip to the next slide, uh, which is 2018, um, the same date of early November in 2018, a year ago. And especially those folks in the southeastern part of the state, we kind of know where that ended up um, with a lot of excess moisture in the spring um, and uh, a lot of standing water all winter, you know, crops unharvested and so on, which can cause issues if you're, you know, looking to graze corn stalks and so on in the, in the winter season. Um, people are still out there harvesting corn right now. So, um, I don't know quite what impact that has on, on the cattle side of things, but I, I know a lot of those guys are still out there harvesting even yesterday and today and probably will through next week. Um, but needless to say, we're at least as wet, if not wetter um, across most of the state as we were a year ago at this time. Um, and looking at the river side of things, you know, not just looking at soils, but 
we have a lot of water still moving through the Jim River in, in particular. Um, and I heard some chatter yesterday that they're expecting um, uh, runoff over the winter season to be higher than they've ever seen in a winter season before. Um, again, they, they had a very wet fall, not just here, but up north uh, in North Dakota. And so uh, a lot of that water is still slowly working its way through, um, especially the, the James River Valley. Um, but again, you see even on the Big Sioux on the eastern side of the state, you know, some of those uh, yellows and oranges um, certainly still slightly high high for this time of year. Um, so, so I think the Jim River will be in flood stage, what they call flood stage for a while at least, and um, we'll have to watch the ice situation as, as we get colder temperatures later this winter. So yeah, there's a lot of water out there, right? We know that, and I think the, the story that, that I think you can guys piece together is that this is all going to increase our risk for flooding and um, moisture issues in the spring uh, when that comes to the snow melt season and the, and the runoff season, um, just because of how much we have out there right now. The soils don't have any capacity right now to take up much more moisture, if any. And um, even a normal winter, I think, um, would be, will, could be challenging um, for a lot of us. So. Uh, whatever that means for you, whether it means maybe a flooded um, cattle yard or feedlot near you or a flooded field that you can't take advantage of, um, maybe uh, some other concerns as well. So we'll keep an eye on that um, as we get through this winter season. So looking ahead uh, towards the climate outlooks, first look at the next week. Um, very pleasant weather for the most part, um, generally pleasant temperatures. Um, no real risk of extreme cold uh, at this point and um, relatively dry conditions uh, for the next seven days. This is just looking at the precipitation side. You know, as we get later in the period, you know, six or seven days out, maybe some increased chance of precipitation in some parts of the state, but overall pretty dry uh, for the next week. So that gets us to next Friday, the 27th. Uh, looking beyond that, the, the last week of the month and into early January, um, this is what we're looking at nationally. On the left there is uh, temperature and uh, fair, fair chance there of warmer than average temperatures continuing there into early January. But you see that big blue area over the west is kind of gradually pushing its way um, into our area. And I think that's going to be our next uh, story as we get into January a little bit later. But at least, you know, end December and start January will be a little bit on the warmer side, it looks like. On the right side, you see the precipitation outlook for the next, uh, for that eight to 14 day period, one to two weeks from now. Um, you know, leaning on the wetter side in general, um, I don't know that we'll see a great big event necessarily, but um, some increased chances of, of precipitation there um, as we end December into early January. Um, to kind of end our, our relatively dry period here uh, in December. So here's the latest that just came out here uh, yesterday from NOAA's Climate Prediction Center, uh, looking at the January outlook. Um, they are looking at that colder uh, pattern uh, to kind of take hold over the northern states uh, sometime in January. And so they are favoring, just slightly favoring, colder than average temperatures. And that's the map on the left um, for the northern tier states from Montana all the way to Maine. Um, and uh, that will kind of get us going here in that midwinter season. In the precipitation outlook on the right, um, there's a lot of mixed signals in, in the climate forecasts um, and the computer models, uh, not really a consistent story. So they, they've kind of backed off um, and from what they were showing before with a wetter January, um, they kind of backed off and now equal chances on this official outlook of wetter or drier or near average uh, precipitation in January. You know, keeping in mind that January is one of the driest months of the year, you know, we generally get less than an inch um, of precipitation in the month. Um, so, 
you know, whether it's really wet or really drier than average, you know, I don't know that that really does tell us a whole lot anyway, but um, for now they're saying equal chances uh, for January's precipitation. Uh, kind of jumping ahead here, um, this is January through March. So looking at the end of winter into early spring, the next three, that three month period there, um, they really hang on to that colder pattern settling over the north central states. Um, and, and that's been pretty consistent in their outlooks as they're especially looking February to April into that spring season. Um, so that could be a, a little bit concerning as we get into that calving season. Um, some guys like it cold, um, some get to kind of freeze the ground to keep the ground frozen, less mud and so on. Some guys, you know, are a little more leery depending how cold it is. Um, you know, if you, you have some of those very young newborn uh, calves um, at risk of the extreme cold. So uh, we'll be, um, of course, that's, that's a concern there. But uh, on the moisture side, there also you see a lot of green there over the northern states as we get in that late winter and early spring season. And I think, um, again, that, that could be adding at least to our moisture problems uh, as we get into, the, into that spring season. Um, this too, wetter pattern has been relatively consistent the last uh, three to four months or so in the computer models. Um, it's consistent with our, our long-term trend of getting wetter winter and wetter spring seasons as well in the last uh, 15, 20 years. And so they're kind of kind of leaning on that, that kind of information in this outlook. Um, there wasn't anything really new that came out here in the last few weeks to change that. And then looking further ahead um, in March through May and I'll show summer here next, um, they kind of back off those polar temperatures in the north, um, but don't really bring in necessarily warmth either, um, but they hang on to that to the wetter pattern again. So uh, I think, you know, looking ahead to what that might mean for you as far as um, opportunities or challenges um, on, on the farm. I think one positive story potentially here is with pasture grass forage production. We had a, a obviously very wet fall. Um, we're carrying over good soil moisture. There's opportunity for very good grass coming out in the spring and especially if if we do turn turn towards that wetter spring and that March April time period. Um, again very good opportunity for some good grass production again um, uh, next year in 2020. Looking ahead uh, just, uh, again, this is crystal ball way out there, um, looking at, um, oh, this is June through August, sorry, not July and August, June through August, uh, midsummer, um, doesn't say much either way on the temperature precipitation side, but what I see here is maybe some opportunity um, for us to kind of get out of that wet pattern, hopefully. Um, summer season precipitation is, is very challenging to look at in the climate sense. Um, this far out, but um, again, you know, that they're showing equal chances um, of wetter or drier or colder or wetter or colder or warmer. Um, you know, hope maybe even that midsummer might work out for us and we can use up some of that water that we're seeing in the early summer and spring season. Um, with that, I think um, some key messages here, we see some I was looking at some Agtegra stuff earlier in the eastern part of the state earlier this week and um, you know they're they're concerned about wet soils as well um, and increased risk of flooding. Um, we see some variability in those winter outlooks as I said the January precipitation doesn't really match what they're saying later winter um, but uh, I think there's fair confidence though in that spring outlook as it's been pretty consistent. Um, and always we have our South Dakota Mesonet out there. If you guys are looking for some tools, we have the extreme minimum wind chill um, tool out there. If you um, happen to suffer some cattle losses in the winter due to cold temperatures. Um, and soon, I think in 2020, early 2020, we'll be launching a new Cal Comfort Index tool as well. Uh, working with Warren Rushi on that. So um, 
stay tuned for, for more coming from the Mesonet uh, on the cattle and livestock side. Um, and here's my contact information. Heather, we haven't moved, so we're still in the same place at Everdeen. <laughs> and I'll take any questions if there are, or um, anything in the chat box I haven't seen yet, so. Okay, any questions for Laura? I don't see any in the chat box either. Um, so uh, with that, I guess uh, I will say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Thank you for taking time out of your days to to join us here. Uh, we will be sending out the recording um, as an email link, so you'll be able to watch the video as a link, uh, provided I can get all of that technology to work and do what it's supposed to do. That is my goal. Um, so if no other questions come in, I would like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, be in touch with any of the specialists that were on the conversations today. Um, if you have questions regarding their topics or if you need help with some er other area um, on your operation. Um, with that, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day and uh, be safe. Thank you. <laughs>